Dude, it's gonna be Satine. <laughs> Here we go. Rudy. <laughs> a bunch of people off camera. Hey. Staring at us. Hey. Yeah. So what well, the key to my show is I'm gonna have like really elaborate vests and ties. <laughs> yes, it's totally vests my thing. Vests and ties. Yeah. No, 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 right over here. That was even close. So Rudy, no, no, trust me. <laughs> I underestimated for your height. Ow. Rudy, give me one. <laughs> Boom. Oh. No, you don't understand. Get, get about a hundred feet away and I'll toss one. Oh, oh, so close! Oh, get off me! It. it touched his mouth. <laughs> it touched his mouth. <laughs> no, it didn't touch my mouth. It touched my tongue. It did. Uh, it's a whole different thing. Well, WebDM fans, you're already shitting yourself if you're watching this video. It is, <laughs> it is, it is the myth, the man, the legend. It is Matt Mercer. Matt, um, first off, thanks for what you do. Uh, it, showing D and D uh, to be to be what it is to a, a bigger audience, right? Like, what, speak on that a little bit, because y'all y'all get some crazy numbers, right? I, I unexpectedly so. Um, yeah, I'm 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 happy. I never expected any of this. <laughs> this this wild you know few years have been just that wild few years. Um, but like you know, role playing games in general have been so important to me growing up, and like I owe a lot to who I am today and. A lot of like the, my social skills and friendships I've learned through these games, and uh, and through that time period, it was just it was it was in a very the dark times of, of my youth anyway. Where like where the game stores were starting to disappear, you know, yeah. and there just oh, yeah. what, there was you were really trying to scramble and find other people that were willing to talk about or even like engage on that level of mm -hmm. yeah yeah I love playing role playing games, mm -hmm. and so. The fact that we now have this, this this kind of renaissance where so many more people are engaging with it, uh, people that are, are no longer even seeming to pay mind to this old stigma yeah. of misunderstanding, yeah. and, it's, and it's just so many people of all different walks of life, all different orientations, all different identifications. It's, it's, it's just, I don't know, this is what I've always wanted it to be, and because of people like you and all this wonderful community, it continues to thrive in that way, and I'm, I'm happy to be just a small part of it. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, in large part, we're here because of the work that Critical Role and you guys have done, because I think you paved the way for, for channels like ours. Um, I, that's just a comment, that's more like a thank you, really. <laughs> uh, I do have a question, though, because yeah. one of the things that I really liked a, a, about Critical Role in the campaign that y'all play is like the, the investment that all the players have in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, maybe you could share like a tip or something for how you start that process of yeah. getting players really involved. Um, well, a lot of that comes with comfort with your group, and so it's hard to press that when you have a bunch <laughs> of new people at the table. Um, so the longer you play, the more that'll be uh, something at the table, but it's also something you talk about with the group. You yeah. know, you don't, can't just expect it or try and force it on the players. You tell everyone, hey guys, do we want to really engage and get really into the role play here? Don't be afraid to. I'll facilitate that. And you, as the dungeon master, might have to kind of pave that way by going out of your comfort zone a little bit mm -hmm. and showing them. You know, if they if they walk into an area, be like, I, I tell the guard, uh, I, I want his aid to find the thief. And instead of going, okay, you say, okay, well, what do you tell them? Yeah. You know, and they'd be like, uh, I, t I tell them, uh, hail, guard, I need your aid. <laughs> And then as opposed to saying the guard comes and approaches you and agrees to help you, you'd be like, well, what do you need my help with? You know, and you put them in that moment where the players half, the, it'll be uncomfortable at first, but once you have that dynamic, that back and forth, it begins to slowly train them that it's okay to really step into the role. And when you have everyone at the table doing it, that's when the real magic starts happening, where you start forgetting about who you are in the moment, and you are this character, and some of those ridiculous things happen, and oh, it's so much fun. where the magic happens. Yeah, yeah exactly. Magic. Hello there, WebDM fans. We're here at Gamehole Con with uh, our second in the Holy Trinity, Chris Perkins. <laughs> wow. And, yeah, no, no, we're going to go ahead and, go ahead and raise the stakes <laughs> right, yeah, right from the beginning. Wow. Um, but the question wow. I think that is burning, uh, just off the top of my head, um, has your hat collection reached critical mass yet? Uh, no, can never have too many, yeah. too many good lids. Yeah, uh, and I just got a new one at the show, a, a, a gray beanie with a D and D ampersand on it. So, it's it's a it's a it, it keeps keeps my head warm, <laughs> keeps my brain warm, and I need that. Yes. Yeah. What are some of your tips for like getting players engaged and sort of like getting them into a game and, and really invested in their characters and being the driving motivator? Big question, I know, but. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's lots of facets to it. Every group has its particular needs, and different groups have different styles. But yeah. I think, by and large, what what the players are looking for is uh, sort of relevance, and they they want their they want their characters' stories to matter. So, in D and D, for instance, we have systems that help you, like uh, backgrounds, ideals, flaws, 
if a DM really wants to engage a player and doesn't know exactly how to do it, one of the things to do is just to prey on those mm -hmm. elements. Maybe prey is not the right word. <laughs> but, <laughs> But to, but to see what those things are, and then you, you try to find ways to bring them into focus in the game. So if, like for instance, the player has a noble background, right. give the chance for the player to meet other noble characters or for that background to actually be important. Right. If they've got a particular flaw or a bond, try to try to incorporate into the adventure you're telling ways to make that relevant. So the, these things are in the game for a reason. Exactly. Right. They're, they're there to give the DMs tools to make the players feel like their characters are important and that the story that's about to unfold is about them. Gotcha. So another question I'm curious is like, what's your favorite monster to use outside of a combat encounter? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, oh, so many to choose from. <laughs> I think uh, one of my favorites would be the hags. Because I like the the fact that the whole cutting a deal with them, that they'll give you something, but you know that the price is going to be higher than you want to pay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the fact that they're so com sort of combat averse, <laughs> that a hag will generally only fight you if it has no other recourse, because it values its own existence above <laughs> all else. Yeah. So I really like that. I also like... Um, some of the more playful monsters like flumps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a flump is a rare lawful good monster. Yeah. It's sort of this psionic feeder, this bottom feeder that uh, you can meet in the Underdark. And it's it's so weird, but also so D&D. &D. So are you responsible for the flump that's in the Whirlstone Caverns and Out of the Abyss? Is, is that there because... Uh... Mm, I, oh God. <laughs> so out of, the, out of the Abyss <laughs> is like many years old. Right, right. So remembering all the details of what got in and what didn't, yeah. probably to some extent. I mean, I had a pretty strong hand in that particular adventure. All right, well, well and, right. and I created a, a lot of, most of the supporting characters for that adventure. I, I asked because it, really, <laughs> it was a really great encounter when we got to use yeah. it uh, in our group. Speaking of uh, Out of the Abyss, it brings attention to one of my other sort of favorite non combat monsters, which are Myconids. Ooh, yeah. Mushroom folk, they're really good. And yeah. there were a couple of good characters from uh, Out of the Abyss that are Myconid sidekicks that you basically get that I really like. Very much. So with, with regards to, to DMing, um, you know, you DM at home, you DM at all these cons. What is your what is your favorite thing about DMing at a con versus a home game that, oh, you, liked, that you like to do? Uh, sowing terror. <laughs> yeah. So with, with my, with my uh, it's, it's a very different experience in some extent because when I'm running my home game, I'm running a prolonged campaign that's going to develop over a fair amount of time and you have time for nuance and you have time for character arcs mm -hmm. to kind of transpire and unfold naturally. Mm -hmm. But at a convention, it's a one-off for the most part. You're just sitting around with a group you've never played before and might never play with again. They've got relatively little investment in their characters. And so I feel as a DM, my goal is to send them home with a good story of how their character died. <laughs> or, you know, I, so or how they barely escaped. Yeah. And so at conventions, I tend to amp up the danger to extreme levels and run the types of encounters that would probably be considered inappropriate. Right. <laughs> now, do you find that harder in 5th edition, since it is a little bit harder to die? I mean, it's been kind of one of the, one of the uh, critique, I don't know if you'd say critique or, or observations. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit harder to die in 5th edition. Not if you kill the cleric first. Uh -huh. There it is. <laughs> There's some real DM tips right here. <laughs> like he said, prey on their back. As, as just happened, yeah. uh, things were going well in the party's favor until the cleric went down, oh, yeah. and then things went downhill. Fast. Uh, yeah. I really love when players completely subvert my expectations and the story goes in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. um, even recently in the recent campaign, without going into too much detail for spoiler reasons, mm -hmm. um, I was teasing toward an eventual possibility of some nautical themed uh, elements and they were on a, you know, near a series of coastal cities and pursuing a few threads that would lead them further up the coast. And right at the beginning of that, they instead derailed, hijacked a pirate ship, and ended up deep in the south, joined a, 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 a pirate faction, and it, the whole story just went off the rails. And I love it. Like that's, that, that to me is, is, is the encapsulation of why D&D and role-playing games are such a different medium than other forms of entertainment, yeah. because you don't really know where it's going to go, and you have the pleasure of you and your friends you know, taking risks and crazy actions and having the whole story kind of change and shift based on that. And oh, yeah. you know, growing up playing video games, you, you find the boundaries, and you're like, okay, I can play in this box. Right, yeah. yeah. There's no box. Yeah. And yeah. once you realize that, it's just such a weirdly creative 
uh, space. I love it's it. Exhilarating. Oh and, yeah. And to be surprised as the dungeon master is the real gift. There. Yeah. Right. Because otherwise, you plan everything. And it's like, why am I even here? <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'll just cool. follow my roadmap. I'll, I'll have yeah. the players find my adventure, and I'll go do something else. Yeah. Good. <laughs> you either good job. Uh, I didn't give you any options to escape from this, or good job me. I apparently am Professor Xavier. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. To, to me, the, the when the players throw you off is nerve wracking. It's gonna be in the moment. That's when you're at your most alive as a dungeon master. When yeah. you're flying by your seat of your pants and you're making everything up. Just, oh, yes. uh, sure, blue haired warrior comes out of the sky in a zeppelin. I don't know what's happening. Oh, God. And bunnies fall from the sky. Exactly. <laughs> One of the things I always tell DM is don't play the, the enemy any smarter than the enemy truly is. Mm -hmm. But a lot of enemies can tell if the characters keep getting back up, they can track that to a source right. and snuff that source out. Yes. It's pretty easy yeah. to find. Yeah. 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 All right, burning question. Here we go. How long should a dungeon master laugh maniacally? when their player, one of their players rolls a one. As long as it takes to tear up their character sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know us, but you have changed my life, Mr. Matt Finch. In a good way or a bad the, way? The, the primer changed, changed my life. In a bad way, I'm not Matt Finch. The primer changed my life. And for me, the OSR was like a huge influence on me. And, and right when it came along was like, I was done with RPGs. It was like hating it and just, I couldn't stand it. And, and I see it as like this movement within RPGs as a whole that is, profoundly influential, right? Like, 5th edition has rulings, not rules, right? Right yeah. there in the text of it. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, I'm curious on your thoughts on it. Like, what's it been like on the inside to, like, see that grow and develop? It definitely didn't start out as any um, large philosophical thing at all. I mean, it started pretty much on the Dragon's Foot forums, <laughs> and that was back in the days when that was, you know, high-end social media. Right, right. People knew that there was a difference between the way they'd been playing with 1st edition and, the, and where things were. Yeah. Some people... Knew people, some people understood that well, other people just didn't, but they were hanging out with the people that they liked to talk to. There were many precursors to what I'd call the OSR. I mean, uh -huh. uh, Castles and Crusades, which really wrote. Right on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, they, basically, fifth edition is an, an, is, is a, an adaptation of a core that comes from Castles and Crusades. But what Castles and Crusades were doing was that they were doing, it was a. Uh, call it a simulacrum game. They, they, we're going to write a, a game that, that operates like first edition D&D, &D, right. um, but isn't necessarily going to be the same. And so that gives us the ability to do the best parts. And so you had some people with that. And then, of course, you also had people who were, were furious about the idea of doing a game that is like a game, but not it. Because right. why not play the original it? And so you had mm -hmm. you know factions within it at the very beginning. It was all about D&D. &D. Yeah. Uh, people weren't applying the old school game concept to other games in D&D. It was just us just being D &D. called the old school right. gamers. When Stuart and I published Osric and people started saying, okay, here's an open game license for uh, first edition D&D. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was an explosion of those. I mean, Dan Proctor came out with Labyrinth Lord, which is one for basic and right. X. Mm -hmm. And then I came out, uh, you know, after about a year of being completely unconscious after finishing Osric, we, I came out with um, the one for original D&D. Um, which was uh, Swords and Wizardry, <laughs> and then you had this proliferation of many, many, many retro clones. Yeah. All kinds of things started moving at, yeah. at the same time, because it was like, you know, all of us before that, we would write, you know, here's my awesome monster, and I've done a great job of writing it, and here's my absolutely shitty picture of the thing because I can't draw. <laughs> right. Um, and so you started to get a little bit more of the artist working with a layout person, working with a writer, and things got... Um, more commercialized, which is either good or bad. I mean, I think that in some ways we put a knife into the hobby in the sense of the, what there was there that was just people trading stuff back and forth. Uh, suddenly, um, you know, those guys suddenly started getting looked down on because their stuff wasn't as polished. And that, you know, and that in, in, in many ways that was, uh, you know, I think we're still getting back to the point in, in many ways where that true fan community is working. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it also hugely expanded um, the the idea of playing D&D in an old school fashion. Because yeah. the, you know, many people will not consider something real unless they see something that is at a fairly high you know, level of which stuff? And which so was that, which yeah. was odd for me because I remember like being really active in the blog sphere at the time, and there was like so many blogs where you'd go on them, and just like it was like gaming fuel. It was just like yeah, it just like injecting it into your imagination, and you. I'd come away from reading these blogs and be like, why am I? 
me paying for a game book that's like bogged down in just the same stuff I've seen before when here's like 20 blogs that they're all doing something yeah. weird and interesting and new. Uh, it was like a, like I said, it, it like completely revitalized my uh, interest in the hobby and, and my like my style of DMing. Well, see, I think, that the so I think that social media has the ability to recapture that that rocket fuel. I mean, yeah. it, I, it was, it didn't get lost because of the commercial stuff. Mm -hmm. It got lost, I think, at the same time as that, but I think what really did it was shifting social media. I mean, because we started out on like one or two forums. Right. And then you get blogs, and then you get G+, and then you get Facebook, and it's fractured more and it's become harder and harder to find the stuff yeah. Yeah. in any single place even as a hub site and so like you know <laughs> about like a year yeah. yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean yeah you could, you could continue that list on forever but those like blog worlds are, are how I, I spent like I said years where you're just like reading people's posts and this person's like going into like I don't know, a, a eight post series on a hex crawl sure. or something and like how to run them and how to make them not boring or something. And then this other person's over here doing something crazy with a setting that's just like laser dinosaurs and, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's just, and the thing and is, the they're, all, so they're, they're all still writing is yeah. the thing, it's, but it doesn't look like it anymore because yeah. it's like if, you know, because I do most of my stuff on Facebook. So like the whole, there was a huge DIY um, old school community on G+. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I never saw any of the stuff going on there. I saw the stuff that was going on with Facebook, and now yeah. they're migrating, uh, probably to MeWe because they're closing down G Plus. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know, whatever next cycle cycles around. Yeah. You know. It, yeah. It, How long do you think it'll be until we get like the Neo Retro clone, the Retro clone <laughs> of Retro clones, a third edition yeah. Retro clone yeah. <laughs> that wasn't Pathfinder? Yeah. yeah. There's no one at Albion Swords. There's oh, no one at Albion okay. Swords. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to cut in line. Uh, no. Uh, no. That's weak. Six. Are we allowed to pick them up? Yeah, I hope so. They are sharp. Be careful. Like, seriously, man. This, this is an example this of what I feel will do. Let's bend like that. So bend I see like it bends, but right it, it won't slice your fingers, though. This is one of my training blades. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need? Fuck. Yeah. yeah. No. There, there you go. I'll be back, Mike. Yeah, I'll show you Before the Before you put that up, I would like to. Like to <laughs> So let me make sure I've got this right. This one's a spat. That's spat. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Yep. It's a Roman cavalry is. sword. Ah. Conan ah, sword. Yeah. Uh, Just have a Conan sword. Oh Rough cut out on CNC gets us to about 78% of the hand grind, free hand grind from there on out. Okay. We do all of our own heat treat in house, individual heat treat. Oh Much more. I feel like I'm one step closer yeah, to solving the riddle of steel. Father sword from the beginning of the movie that they punch in the snow. Yeah. To hell with your crom. Do it myself. Which one? This is a. This is heavy. I think the Conan. Is this a sex? That's yeah. It'd be a lang sex. Sorry, yeah. right? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah there we go. You're gonna do your uh, sword form? <laughs> no, I am not going to start slinging this around. No. Arnold actually has ordered like 20 or 30 of these from us for like presentation pieces and stuff. Just he just hands out swords. Right. Right. The one that was. He'll have a sword. Yeah, I'm a sword. How many swords do you own at this present moment, Jim? I own three swords, um, at least one of which is claimed to be like a full, you know, you could, you could fight with it, it won't break. I've got a couple wall hangers that I got when I was like 11, I guess, and then a gladius. Cut people's this. legs off. Right, you could just like, the Greeks filed complaints uh, because of this design that punches through chain armor. You could just like punch right through it. It's this sort of chisel tip and then this wide blade. Um, that you would stab into the bellies of your. Uh, but you could also hack with it. Uh, and just, I think it was the Beholder video that got me. Oh, yeah, that was a lot yeah, of That was a big one. That was a big one. I was putting Beholder into my campaign, and, you know, by the way, he's got the stuff from the Michigan military. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff out. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, man. Thanks, Having a good con? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Played any yet? I got to play it a couple times. I'm running. And, 12 hours. Now trying to play it. So, are you oh, doing nice. a big open? No, I'm not oh. doing I'm going to see some here. Okay. Uh, Spearmen. But you could also hack with it. You can also hack with it and take off limbs. And the Greeks, after like some of the first Roman invasions of the Greek mainland, they came to Rome and they were like, hey, when you waged war on us, you fought us with weapons that was like, 
you, you can't do that. You're just supposed to use a spear. They were mad. Like you can read about like these uh, these lawsuits that were brought against Roman generals and things from the Greeks who are like, they complained. They're like, you can't just show up with a gladius like that. They're like, sorry, man, we beat your phalanx any day of the week.